Trappist beers are brewed in abbeys and monasteries by Cistercian monks. These special brews are twice the strength of most beers and they're made using secret recipes from a bygone era. But it's a challenge for this ancient order to keep up with modern demand. So, how do they do it? The Scormont Plateau near Chimay in Belgium is the site of a Trappist monastery built over 160 years ago. And this order of mostly silent monks have hidden within the abbey walls a world-renowned brewery. Their unique brew uses divinely inspired secret recipes and a special yeast, developed in 1948 by the now legendary figure of Father Theodore. The problem was Theodore's beer became so popular that brewing got in the way of worship. So now they've entrusted a team of brewing experts with their secret recipe. It's the job of master brewer Paul Arnott to ensure Father Theodore's instructions are followed religiously. This is the first stage of the process, what we call mashing in. This is where we mix the malt, wheat flour and water drawn from our wells. Unlike Father Theodore, brewers now control the process using computers. And after a few hours of computer-controlled cooking, all the starch has been converted into sugars, and the mash is now what's known as wort. But it's still full of grains and husks. So this is filtered through a series of fabric screens. The next trial is to boil the wort in a hop kettle at 100 degrees to give this brew its bitter taste. Most importantly here, we'll be adding the hops to the wort, which will impart the uh, bitterness and the hop aroma to the final beer. A sample of the wort is tested using a hydrometer. This instrument tells the brewer whether there are enough sugars in the wort for the yeast to convert into alcohol during the coming fermentation process. The more sugar at this stage, the stronger the beer will become, and the strength of this brew is one of the things that sets it apart. Here we add the yeast, which is going to eat the sugar and convert that into alcohol and CO2 gas. The fact that the yeast was actually isolated by Father Tedop is a part of the authentic nature of our product. After a week of fermentation, the beer has an alcohol content of at least 6.5%, which is 50% stronger than your average beer. But to that strength, they now need to add subtlety. And that takes time in maturation tanks. Above me, we have a maturation tank. It will remain for a period of two weeks at low temperature prior to bottling. Before the beer can be bottled, the brewers must ensure it's up to scratch. Each of these little bottles represents a brew of 50,000 litres. And Paul's finely tuned taste buds ensure that this latest batch has the aroma, the flavour and the quality to deserve the Shime Trappist label. But it still isn't quite monk strength. And the next process is one of the things that makes this brew so special. More sugar and yeast are added for a second fermentation, which will take place in the bottle itself. This will eventually add another half percent of alcohol, bringing this brew to Trappist levels. With the beer now fermenting for a second time, it's off to the bottling plant in Baylor. And things have moved on a bit since monks first filled bottles by hand. In keeping with the wishes of the monks, the plant recycles around 60% of its bottles. It's been estimated that these can be reused up to 10 times. Empty bottles are carefully removed from crates, sorted, washed and disinfected in preparation for a thorough steam cleaning. 40,000 bottles an hour are cleaned, then stripped of their old labels before they're slotted back into the production line. This busy line recycles up to half a million bottles per day. Next, a high-tech camera detects any imperfections. On crack, chip or floor, and the bottle is cast aside. 40,000 bottles per hour are then filled by this ultra-fast machine which also stoppers the bottles immediately after filling. This batch is of the popular Shime Red Cap variety. 
labelling comes next, and then the beer is crated up. However, the crates are not sent out straight away. It takes around three weeks for the fermentation process to completely convert the added sugar into the extra alcohol content required to make a beer strong enough for thirsty monks. Who retain a healthy habit for drinking it. And they're not the only ones. It's also exported to 40 countries around the world. There are 250 million cars and trucks in the USA. And one US factory churns out 250,000 new ones every year. They employ over 3,600 people and use the latest in robot technology. Yet incredibly, this factory produces almost no waste at all. So, how do they do it? Rural Indiana. With its vast fields and old weathered barns, this is the heart of corn country. But for over 20 years, it's also been car country. Because this is the home of Subaru of Indiana, a 278,000 square meter car plant producing a quarter of a million vehicles a year. Here they build three different models, the Outback, the Legacy and the Tribeca. And they don't just assemble imported components, they start from scratch with these 12,000 kilo coils of steel. The steel goes into the five-storey blanking press where it's flattened and cut to size. Off-cuts don't go to waste, they'll be recycled into new steel coils. One reason why this factory is the first ever zero landfill car plant in America. Now the steel blanks have to be moulded into shape by one of five transfer presses. Here they bend, trim, punch and fold the cold steel into the shape of a car door. The doors are sent onto the body shop. Here each vehicle starts to come together. With over 4,000 welds needed to build a car, this is a job for the robots. And what robots they are. The auto industry leads the way in robot technology, and these welders are like something from science fiction. 266 of the world's most advanced robots weld and seal the body shells. But it's still the human eye that is best for checking for defects. And that happens in a light tunnel, before heading off along the factory's 17 kilometres of conveyors. A motor car won't go far without a motor. And here on the engine sub-assembly line, they build the company's latest 2.5-litre, 170-horsepower engine. But unlike almost every other car on the road, the four cylinders in this engine lie flat instead of being upright. The pistons pump in and out like two boxers sparring, which is why this is called a boxer engine. Next comes the drivetrain, which takes the power of the engine and delivers it to the wheels. The trouble is the drivetrain and engine produce some noise and vibration when they're pushed to their limits. So instead of attaching them directly to the body shell, they mount them on a separate subframe with rubber dampers that absorb the vibrations and eliminate noise. As each car moves along the line, more and more components are added. But at this factory, a single production line makes all three models. So to make sure they don't put a Tribeca dashboard into an outback, the factory's computers marshal a swarm of automatic guided vehicles. These deliver the right parts at just the right time to Jeff Bruner and the guys in the trim and final section. And these guys are the Usain Bolts of car construction. We do a car about 1.34 minutes. Incredibly, they put the finishing touches on each car in less time than it takes to boil a kettle. Because this is such an intricate process and each vehicle may be slightly different, 
Robots can't be trusted here, but Jeff's lightning team of trimmers run like clockwork. It may look like a finished car, but before each one leaves the factory, it has a workout to make sure it's up to standard. So there's a quick run on the free roller. And then it's into the showers. However, these 160 psi jets of water aren't simply here to wash the car. They reproduce the effect of hurricane force rain, ensuring that every seal is watertight. Once every 20 minutes, they pick a car at random and let it out into the wild. And this really is the wild. The Indiana factory is surrounded by over 200 acres of wildlife habitat. Running through it are three kilometers of track, where engineer Ryan Chevalier puts the new car through its paces. And it straightened the car out. At last, it's ready for the road. Just 249,999 more to go this year. This car's passed all of its tests, and it's ready to go to its new owners.